Hi! Welcome to this video where I will be addressing how to care for the beautiful and varied genus of Oncidium orchids. A video long overdue, but I have had Carrie Midkiff's comment that brought a common issue to my attention in my files all this time, which I am finally going to address by giving some insight to the conditions required for growing Oncidiums. Seeing as there are approximately 330 species out there and goodness knows how many genus within the Oncidium Alliance, I have prepared care cards for you so that you can take screenshots of the most commonly seen on the market. I thought it might be useful if you see that you already have some of those orchids or come across the name on your shopping sprees so that you have a quick care guide card for easy and immediate access of information. Back in the day, I prepared myself for incoming orchids with cards like these, and while I was writing them out for every orchid in an order, the care was somewhat already embedded in my mind, which resulted in, on arrival of the orchids, it was not that cold of an introduction. I felt I already had a head start, so I figured why not add something revamped into this video and see if it is a helpful tool for you as well. Consider it like the Rolodex of Oncidium Orchid Care. <laughs> the care cards will pop up at random throughout the video and are divided into two groups. Some are grouped under the category of the Common Oncidium Alliance genera, and others are grouped under the category of Common Oncidium Alliance Nothogenera. genera. I hope that providing specific care cards will make it easier to understand Oncidium care because it would be irresponsible of me to put out a care video without pointing out some specifics simply because <laughs> the genus is all over the place. While some can fall under the same or similar care, there are others that need to be sectioned out to avoid disappointment and unsuccessful results. So, for orientation purposes, the care cards have a seal on them, giving an idea as to how finicky some Oncidium Alliance orchids are as opposed to others. Once you see the section of the Nothogenus Oncidiums, you will see that they are relatively easy to grow, relative being relevant, because of course certain conditions still have to be met. Every orchid is easy to grow if the conditions we provide are met. While I may have difficulty with some Oncidiums because of my conditions and for that reason I did not even buy them, others have the ideal conditions and those Oncidiums will do very, very well in their environment. However, taking the environments out of the question in comparison within the individual genuses of the Oncidium Alliance group of orchids, there are a few that I have stamped with an X seal because, in my opinion, they require more specific conditions compared to others, those being lower temperatures, lower light levels, higher humidity, and specific watering needs as well as airflow needing to be much higher based on their humidity requirements while still being in a cool environment. The expert seal is not there to discourage anyone wanting to grow those orchids. It is there to create awareness that these orchids will require different conditions to what we would normally think. So, no matter your level of expertise or experience in growing orchids, your conditions may be so ideal for those that you will find them easy. That is the difference I am hoping to point out. Please take the seal identification as something that is meant to capture your attention, to have a closer look at the care requirements, and not as me saying that you may find them difficult. The reverse may be true for you, and if you have an easy time at growing what I sealed as expert, then I would love for you to leave your experience in the comments because many times people come to the comments section to get more information from a different perspective. The monologue of a video turns into a dialogue thanks to the comments section. The care cards also give an option to the setup and media requirements, organic media as well as inorganic media, and remember that all epiphytic orchids can be mounted. If you have enough space and or your climate permits al fresco growing within the canopy of the trees in your landscape. My cards focus on the culture in pots, with the exception of some that I highly recommend to grow mounted because they are as such climbers, that growing those in pots will always be a challenge. Seeing as my little itty bitty selection of Oncidium Alliance orchids you see here is not abundant but varied in many ways, 
I will provide you a care guide to the watering and potting up requirements based on the characteristics that orchids come with, which are many times a one glance dead giveaway because we're focusing on roots, leaves, temperature variables, and tolerance, and some fertilizer variables. The first thing I always like to do is break down the care for Oncidium Alliance orchids by taking the different root systems into consideration. There's a huge clue when it comes to root structure because the roots come in all sizes from the very chunky fleshy cattleya-like roots to very fine spindly and to some degree wiry roots. No matter the insidium you already have or plan to get, if you are not familiar with anything but the attractive blooms that caught your attention, when you receive your insidium, the root size will give you a very clear idea as to what the media size requirements are. Even dead roots will tell you a lot. As a rule of thumb, chunky roots will do best in chunky media and then all the way down the root size spectrum, the fine roots will do best in small media. And of course, there are one or two exceptions in there. <clears throat> Tolumnia, I'm talking to you. But this goes for organic media as well as inorganic media as suggested on the care cards. Take note that large media does not always equate to wet dry cycle. In general, Oncidium Alliance orchids are very thirsty and love their water. The care cards will point out which ones, however, prefer a drier winter rest as opposed to the majority not wanting to dry out too much or for too long in between watering. Seeing as the watering is so heavy and the media is continuously wet, a lot of flushing has to also be taken into consideration because while insidiums are in active growth, they also want a lot of fertilizer and supplements. Some more so than others, but in general, no matter the size of the insidium, they are vigorous growers once they get their grow on and they can grow multiple growths at a time, as well as multiple spikes loaded with blooms. Those will need to be supported by plenty of fertilizing and watering. The flushing with the Oncidium Alliance cannot be underestimated. It is not necessary in climates that have a lot of rain where the orchids grow al fresco in pots or are left to their own devices in the canopy of the trees in the landscape, but greenhouse or indoor grow spaces, that is where flushing is fundamental. When I speak of fertilizer levels, that will depend on the overall size of the insidiums you are growing, and the amount can vary from 100 parts per million at every watering when it comes to tolumnias, fine-rooted insidiums that are of small growth. And then 300 parts per million is what I recommend for the giants of the alliance like Brassias or in my collection, the Colmenara Masai Red. So let me just explain based on my little collection why I'm giving you such conservative numbers. And then you will see it is not under fertilizing. So I dose at 300 parts per million for a giant Oncidium well, the, the giant in my collection, when in active growth, my colmenara will absorb the reservoir within three days. Even while the temperatures are cooler and I fertilize it with 300 parts per million every time, meaning the orchid is getting 600 parts per million of fertilizer every week. Now you see my setup is Lekka and self-watering in this instance. I do not have to worry about watering every day, but Growing this orchid in chunky bark, for example, in a pot while in active growth, it will require watering at least once a day with fertilizer and then flushing it one time per week. In my setup, I flush in between filling the reservoir again with fertilizer solution or a supplement solution. The one thing I would like to have more of in my climate is humidity. All Oncidiums appreciate a humidity of at least 50%, but anything above 60% is better with the airflow to match. I have the airflow, I do not have the humidity, and this brings me to the often posed question and problem of Oncidium leaves growing unsightly spots, which many times makes us think we have a fungus or a bacterial infection. Then there is the drying out of the leaves at the tips and having a form of color break in the coloring of the leaves, which can be seen when the light shines from behind. Keep in mind, Oncidiums grow their new growths relatively quickly, so let's address the effect of not enough humidity. 
Lack of humidity while in active growth will affect how the fresh and tender leaves can grow clean. Many times it is the lack of humidity that causes spots to appear, which have nothing to do with a fungus, but are a result of environmental influences. The tender cell structures dehydrate as they grow. If the humidity is super high, and there is not enough airflow to match, then the likelihood of the spotting being a fungus is very, very high. In either circumstances, supplementing with calcium can help avoid those problems from occurring, but it is not a guarantee. However, tender growths need support in growing sturdy cells, and sturdy cells will in turn be able to ward off any adverse conditions much better than weak cells. So understanding your conditions will help you in a better diagnosis of what is happening with your leaves. If the humidity is super high without airflow, oncidiums will also be more prone to rot than in a drier, less humid climate. So there's always the balance between too much of a good thing and not enough of the other. The added calcium will also help ward off any rot issues. So before we even get to the subject of fertilizer and supplementation, you already know that calcium and oncidiums are a match made in heaven. While we all want to grow our orchids to perfection, well, at least I tell myself that this time, I'm going to make sure that these new growths won't look unsightly. Well, I'm quickly schooled by my surroundings and I have come to accept that up to a certain point, I can do everything in my power to live up to my own expectations, but eventually the spotting and leaf tips drying out will happen. Back in the day when I used to get frustrated about it, I started to comfort myself that I was not growing my orchids to take them to a show. That has stuck with me and now I'm just happy that they are growing to the best of their ability within the conditions they have to deal with. And they bloom, and some of them even smell nice too. So that is my main aim. If I were to be picky about the foliage of my oncidiums and have to try and ward off any of the spotting and the leaf tips drying, I should not be growing any oncidiums in my climate. So let's go back to oncidiums and active growth growing relatively fast. Many times there is a little bit of panic when the discoloration of the leaves is observed and the mind understandably races towards the conclusion that the orchid has a virus, but more often than not, this is not the case. Of course, without a virus test kit, one cannot be 100% sure that these color breaks in the leaves are not an actual fact of virus, but the blooms will be a great sign if the orchid does in actual fact have a virus. So in order to assess a virus or determine why the leaves have a color break without using a virus test kit, we have to take the light levels and other requirements into consideration for any of the following symptoms to be diagnosed correctly. Assuming that the orchid has the right light levels, fertilizer and supplementation is all dialed in, then if there is a color break in the blooms, there are lines or markings or some deformities that make no sense, stunted lips, fused petals and sepals, etc. All these appearances would signal that the orchid does have a virus. But if the orchid grows in blooms with perfect looking blooms according to its schedule, then any appearances or imperfections on the leaves are due to environmental issues, not because it has a virus. Take note though, allow the orchid to bloom for several cycles, just in case there is some oddness within the bloom structure and color when she blooms for you for the first time. First time bloomers may show odd things in the bloom. Repot stress and transportation shock, etc., etc., are all factors that could affect quality of blooms. So, Give any oncidium that raises eyebrows a few bloom cycles and seasons within your collection before determining a virus right out of the gate. You see, the imperfections of color break in the leaves can also be because of genetic interferences. Remember, if we don't add the calcium, give them enough structure and strength to grow well. Remember that we've got all that dialed in. Genetic interferences, we are talking about hybridized and hybridized and hybridized anothogenus of orchids. They are so overbred that the orchid probably is having a major identity crisis. The blooms are amazing. The leaves, however, will always show something odd. Their genetic petri dish is hard to pick apart for the commercially bought orchids. 
and they may do the strangest things that have nothing to do with the culture being wrong. Everything is fine from light requirements to fertilizer, humidity and temperature, etc. The leaves may never be perfect. Because the crossing of Oncidium Alliance orchids focuses on how the bloom size will be, the color impressions, the bloom count and the vigor of growth, blooming with every mature growth and non-stop growing so that the orchid blooms spectacularly multiple times a year, etc, etc. If the breeders were to concentrate on the quality of the leaves holding up, then we would have some impressive looking oncidiums on the shelves. Performance of the leaves as the orchid grows gets overlooked though, and that will show once the orchid settles into your collection. 99% of the time, the heavily bred oncidiums we buy by the name of Cambrias do not have a virus. Once they leave the perfect climate-controlled mass-produced nurseries and come into our possession where one thing may not be quite on point, then bit by bit those signs will appear but the orchid is still healthy. So just a little tangent, but now that I've mentioned the word Cambria, what is it? Well, apart from being what the country of Wales is called in Latin, <laughs> Cambria is in actual fact a broad name used to cover many different orchid crosses. A Wilstacara, for example, will be on the shelf labeled Cambria orchid. That does not mean that it comes from Wales, but the fact that the mass producer could not be bothered to actually give the correct name or just didn't know it for themselves, and hey, it has more intergeneric hybrids in its parentage, hence Cambria. But if you're still curious about if it has a proper name or not, and you have yourself a Cambria in your collection, you can see if the blooms you have match any of the millions of images on the interwebs and usually come across the name. So let's just say somebody comes to your home, they know you love orchids, picked you up an orchid and it's got Cambria on its little tag in the pot. Well, usually the tag has a web page of sorts that can be looked up on the interwebs and if that nursery is a mass producer, they will have a whole gaggle of images where probably a name will appear and if not, then the rabbit hole starts and very quickly similar orchid blooms will pop up in your recommendations and I am sure you will be able to identify your bloom relatively quickly. But I'm digressing. <laughs> Cambria here, Cambria there. Land of the dragons. Anyway, let's get back to the temperature variables for Insidium Alliance orchids. On the care cards, I have specified temperatures that I deem safe for successfully growing the orchids. However, some may have a temperature tolerance that can only be determined once the orchid is in your collection. For example, I would have never thought that my Colmenara would tolerate temperatures as low as 5 degrees Celsius. The care card states 12. But here is mine doing really well despite the low temperatures. And it does not just have to tolerate such low temperatures on occasions, instead, it can be a week to 10 days of those lows and there's no reprieve during the day temperatures balancing out an average for the orchid to recover in. When my temperatures go that low at night, the days are usually hovering around the 14 degrees Celsius mark. While many Oncidiums can tolerate lower temperatures than stated on the care cards, it is always advisable to err on the side of caution and be aware that they can tolerate lower temperatures for one or two nights only. And then they will suffer. And they will tell you very, very quickly by showing anthocyanin in some cases as that increases as a protection from the cold exposure. Or some may show pseudobulbs starting to turn a light yellow, feeling soft, and then rot out. Those are the things that we can see, but what some of us may not be able to see is the death of the root system because of cold exposure. And just to be on the safe side, when I put out these recommendations, the care cards have temperatures on the conservative side, and well, you may be surprised as to how well your insidium will adapt to your climate and that it can go much lower for longer than you expected. And then, hey, you're both winning. I am so relieved that my Colmenara can go so low because the size of this orchid took me completely by surprise. When it arrived, it had nice sized pseudobulbs and it was half the total size, including the spike compared to what you see now because here I am cultivating 
large peach size suitables and leaves that are as long as 60 centimeters and the spikes reach 80 centimeters i'm telling you just as well it can grow outdoors because there is no room in the inn during the winter here in my climate not after it exploded like this so know that your medium size oncidium can possibly grow into something unexpected as well <laughs> they are just amazing so now let's address some of the fertilizer and supplement quantities, which is also something that would be specific to the size and vigor of the orchid you have. I have given the concentration amount on the care cards based on what I apply here in my collection in southern Spain. As mentioned, when in active growth, my oncidiums get their reservoir filled two times per week, so the individual amount that is stayed on the care card doubles. When I supplement, it is with CalMag and seaweed, Usually, I start a month prior to the temperatures reaching the preferred range as we come out of winter and into spring. But in winter, I administer CalMag only and only add the seaweed into that mix a month prior to temperatures rising to boost the hormones that the orchid is mobilizing within itself as new growths may be on the way. And we're back to calcium but now with a little added adage of magnesium. So the reason I only apply CalMag in winter and not seaweed, I really zero in on CalMag is because of my cold temperatures in the grow space for those that do come inside to give them a little something something that helps to counteract the stress levels which cold temperatures and lack of light induce. My aim is to tie them over with calcium to keep their cell walls strong and magnesium to help them photosynthesize the little light that they get. I do not go above 60 parts per million of CalMag and once again I do not add seaweed in their non-growing phase. Should they be in active growth during winter and early spring, that includes pseudobulbs starting to plump, then I watch the light levels to ensure I can give them a little fertilizer but not too much because I do not want the growths or anything to bolt for lack of light and having too much fertilizer in it. That would result in the cells growing weak. If all of mine have matured their growths by the time the conditions become less favorable, then there are only sporadic flushes to keep the climate of the pot healthy. Usually, my oncidiums will have completed all their growth by the end of fall, so the fertilizing can stop just in time. But if you have ideal conditions and yours are growing all year round, then fertilize and supplement away because they will need it and they love it. Unless <laughs> an oncidium is a species that has a certain winter care requirement, which is where the expert seal comes in to draw your attention to that fact. Unless it is a species that has certain winter care requirements. Oncidiums are continuous growers where the conditions are favorable all year round. So fertilize and supplement and water away at your heart's content. Light levels for the oncidiums in my collection are generally high, but as much as I can avoid direct sun, they are in bright shade or direct afternoon sun. Still, the Colmenara has to deal with the direct Spanish sun during the months of July and August. That is when I get burnt leaves because the heat is compounded by warm, dry wind. If your oncidiums live in a climate with high humidity, then along with the airflow, the leaves will stay cool and can take the direct sun because the humidity will buffer against the heat coming from the sun. If you are further north or further south, depending on which hemisphere you are in, know that your daily temperatures will determine what is considered adequate light. When I say bright shade in my climate, bright shade may be the same light levels as what you have with direct sun but your temperatures may be lower. Airflow is cool. is cool. For that reason, your oncidium leaves will not singe. If you are growing your oncidiums in a grow room or a conservatory with artificial lights, the best way to avoid leaf burn is, of course, to provide plenty of airflow, but to also not have the leaves get too close to the light source. Even humidity will not help to avoid a leaf singeing in the case of artificial light. In my past experience, moving the leaves via airflow gives them time to cool down 
and not have the magnifying glass intensity of a grow light on one spot of the leaf for many hours. Touching the leaves helps to determine if it is too close to the light source. And keep in mind that some oncidiums will not show anthocyanin before burning, so they'll just burn. They won't give you a heads up. This also applies for artificial lights that do not heat up. And I say that as an add-on because a lot of people say my artificial lights do not heat up, but there is a magnifying glass effect of the light pinpointing a specific area of the leaf for many, many hours, which will cause it to burn whether your lights heat up the room, the space or not. And keeping that airflow going will keep that leaf moving and that will avoid any singeing or burning of leaves to happen. Now, I sincerely hope that this video will have given further insight into the care for Oncidium Alliance orchids. They are so varied and despite being categorized as an alliance, the care for them is also varied and it should not be lumped up into one general care. Nothogenus, pretty much, yes, general care, but the different Oncidium genuses, there are some that have their special requests, which I hope the care cards will have pointed out to then be able to execute with ease. If you have any questions and notice that I have not included some Oncidium species or Nothogenus in the care cards, which you may be growing and have any follow-up questions about, please bring that to my attention and we can go over your Oncidium in more detail, either in the comments or by filling out the help form that I have pinned in the comments section. The hybridization of the Oncidium is already something akin to a frenzy, in my opinion, and more and more Nothogenus will pop up. So I just hope that the ones I did include in the care cards will provide sufficient information to be of help for the time being. <laughs> and if I have to do a follow-up video, with more Nothogenus and more species? Well, I can always do that, just let me know. Anywho, thank you, Carrie Midkiff, for bringing this topic to my attention, even though it was not exactly a direct request, but that one little detail of no matter how soon I water them after purchase, they shrivel, caught my attention. I hope this was useful, brought further insight, and prompted more questions. If that is the case, keep the questions coming, and I will do my best to help out. Thank you so much for watching. Have yourself a beautiful day on one condition that you stay safe and take care. Bye.